people ask people ask me sometimes in workshops is it okay to just make up a story hmm. for a business point right mike could i could i just modify my story to make it better my customer success story or tell a story about something that really didn't happen but makes a true point and this is what i say in our culture we have stories that probably aren't true that are highly persuasive we call them myths and fables or parables right they're probably not factually true but they make very true points but notice something very important about these stories they are attributed to people like jesus gods famous scientists people who have huge credibility in their society not salespeople. Salespeople are not in that category right you're in a category that if you make up story you 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 blow your credibility right there you I mean you don't have you don't actually have the credibility to tell a mythical story a fable from cave drawings to family histories to stories around the fire, humans crave order among chaos, connection amid isolation. So we tell stories. Our mission at the Storytellers Network is to bring the art of story to the masses. Whether you're in marketing, you're an entrepreneur, or you're developing your own personal brand, telling your story effectively can make the difference between celebrating milestones and collecting unemployment. The Storytellers Network strives to help storytellers tell their stories so you can learn from the best. Now, your host, the inbound evangelist himself, Dan Moyle. And welcome to the Storytellers Network podcast. I'm so glad you're joining me today and you're listening in on this conversation because in this episode, number nine of season four, uh, I get to, we get to hear from an engineer turned salesperson, Mike Adams, who taught himself storytelling on the job while selling and managing sales teams in the United Kingdom in Russia, India, China, Vietnam, Indonesia, that weren't enough, uh, Malaysia and Australia, for international corporations, Schlumberger, which you'll hear about, uh, Siemens, Nokia, and Halliburton. Uh, since 2014, Mike has been helping companies find and develop their own stories through his storytelling consulting practice. Uh, Mike's actually married, he's got three sons, he lives in Melbourne, Australia, we'll hear about all that. Uh, and today, Mike Adams shares with the Storytellers Network his storytelling craft, his successes and stumbles, some amazing insight and great inspiration. In other words, Mike shares his story. Now, as we get into that story and the conversation, just a friendly reminder that visit storytellersnetwork.com for more episodes from past seasons, for how to contact me and for other resources to help you better tell your story. And if you're new, text the word storytellers to 31996 to subscribe. Now, let's get to the stories. <music> So thanks for taking time to uh, to hang out with me today, Mike, and talk to the Storytellers Network listeners. Man, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Dan. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. So, so you're a storyteller. In fact, your book, Seven Stories Every Salesperson Must Tell, obviously focuses on story. Um, one thing I like to kind of find out is where everybody is, because you can be a storyteller from anywhere. And I'm excited because this is my first time interviewing somebody this international. So where are you, Mike? I'm talking to your listeners from Melbourne, Australia. It's been raining, but it's warm. We've got about <laughs> 21 degrees C, which I don't know what that is in, in uh, Christian units. That's probably, um, I don't know, 70 or something like that. All right. Sounds like a beautiful yeah. day then. It's, 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 it's absolutely fine. Yeah. Right so, so I'm in Michigan where it's autumn. You're on the other side in the bottom of the spring, world. Spring. Spring. Oh, everything's okay. bl bl Yeah. We're just coming into spring. Beautiful. <laughs> I love it. So, so let's talk a little bit, Mike, about, about stories. Now, I heard you on the Douglas Burdett, the Marketing Book Podcast show. And uh, for yep. listeners that want to dive deep with, with Mike, go listen to Douglas. It's a great interview. I don't want to mirror the same questions, but I want to talk a little bit about story and the idea that, you know, my goal with the Storytellers Network is to inspire people, whether they're, you know, business owners, whether they're in marketing, whatever it is. But really, the more I hear from storytellers, the more I realize that everything we do can really kind of revolve around storytelling. It can be in the boardroom. It can be selling something to your parents as a teenager. It can be in business. So let's talk a little bit about you and where you came from with story. And then, and then I want to kind of help people understand storytelling for sales because that really is what a lot of us do. So, so Mike, let's start a little bit with, with you. Go back to, did you, you weren't always a storyteller, were you? 
No, I probably started from the, uh, the least likely position, which is uh, electrical engineer. You know, we are, we are not storytellers as a rule, us engineers, right? We, we want facts and figures, you know. And I got into sales by, by accident. I didn't want to be a salesperson, but it came with uh, a trip to Norway to go and live in Norway. You know, I couldn't turn that down. And, and so um, that's, that's how I got into selling. And, and of course, what you're confronted with when you take on a sales role is how do you persuade? How do you get important ideas across uh, to other people that, that probably aren't open to those ideas? And if there's one thing engineers are good at, it's problem solving. And I saw that as a problem to solve. And, uh, you know, I think, uh, uh, yeah, it's interesting. I take you back to an early experience. Um, well, I also had marketing roles at that time in the mid 90s. So I had sales and marketing roles and, and I had a particular job to, to take up a one hour time slot in a, um, in a user forum in Prague, in, in the Czech Republic. Uh, we had, 400 of our clients there and there's a very diverse audience and I had to present our new software and our new software had it had something for everyone in it but it wasn't very interesting for 80 percent of the audience whatever you were talking about right so it was a difficult thing to like how do I take up a whole hour and I hit on this idea of writing a, a play and getting my technical people to act out this play so this was engineers and geologists and geophysicists we're selling oil and gas software and the, and the team didn't like the idea at all, you know, but I thought, look, this is, this is more interesting than getting up and demonstrating the features and benefits of the software. So they did, we came up with a little scenario and they acted out a scenario from our customer's business using our software. It went for about 50 minutes. And then the questions from the audience went for about another hour, like straight through the coffee break into the next event. They were just fascinated. And the actors in the play just stayed in character as they answered the questions, right? So the, the clients really wanted to know how that story ended and how it, how it sort of started. And, and that was a clue to me that, um, that the, the concept of a story was much more engaging than delivering the facts. We didn't actually talk about any of the, the facts of the software. We just showed people using the software, right? And what it meant for them. But the problem, of course, is, um, you know, doing that is incredibly time consuming. You know, that's kind of like, you know, writing a novel. Mm -hmm. And what I learned over time is that you can condense these stories down into little narratives, little one, two minute narratives. And, and those are the things that I've since sought out. And I'll give you an example of where I kind of noticed that I noticed that it that the stories do work. They work for you in the background. So if you're like me and a little bit lazy, it's good to come across a technique that does work for you without you having to do anything. I, I was, um, my first sales management role was in Russia. We transferred our family to Moscow. It's our three, three young boys at that stage, they're kind of kindergarten, grade one, grade two age. And, um, and I, my job was, um, was to sell software throughout the former Soviet Union. And, and it was very new to the Russians. They hadn't really heard of us and they hadn't really heard of our company. Even though the company I was working for, Schlumberger, is, is the biggest oil and gas services um, business in, in the business, right? It's a $30 billion company. It's a US French company. And, um, but I came across this story about our company and I started telling it. And then I started hearing my clients telling me the story back. This is where you know your story is doing work. And I'll tell you the story briefly, which is, which is a, a composite of the Schlumberger company story and Schlumberger in Russia. Now, Schlumberger started in the late 1920s. It was founded by two French brothers from Alsace. So actually it's a, it's a Schlumberger, it's a German word that's been Francificized and then uh, Anglicized, right? So Schlumberger is how the, how the American oil and gas people would say it. So these, these brothers invented a technique for measuring, to, measuring the resistivity of the fluid in the rock in an oil well. So when you go deep underground, you drill a, you know, an oil well, you know, thousands of feet in the ground, you want to know where the oil is. And the problem is the water in the mud in the oil well pushes the oil away. Um, 
but the oil has high resistivity and the water has low resistivity. So if you can measure the resistivity as you go up through the oil well, you know where the oil is. And that was a fabulous invention. That's made a $30 billion company. But you know, when you have a new discovery, it's not so easy to get it accepted. And the place in the world that accepted it first was the Soviet Union. And Schlumberger had, had logging, they call it logging trucks, all through the, the Soviet Union and the, and the Russians were the first to really appreciate that this was a, a really powerful technique. Mm. And then Stalin nationalized them. Stalin basically stole all their equipment, kicked them out of the country. There's a kind of a darker side to this story, actually, in terms of what actually happened to the Schlumberger people. Mm. So this was, that was in 1938. And, um, and so Schlumberger was out of Russia. But by that time, they'd started the business and they were successful all over the world. They went to the US next and were very successful in the US. But in the late 80s, early 90s, Schlumberger had to make a decision. Do we go back into Russia or not? And they, and they took a business case to the CEO. And they said, uh, you know, how much are you willing to risk? And he had a very short answer. It was 200 million. I'm willing to risk $200 million to get back into Russia. Specific. And they, <laughs> yeah, very specific. You know, you can waste 200 million. And um, so they, they picked two of the recently privatized Russian oil companies and poured resources in. They put in CFO, chief production manager, and doubled the production of these companies inside 18 months. So the Russian oil, oil industry at that time was in a nosedive, and these two companies were suddenly doubling their production. Mm. And Schlumberger now makes more than a billion dollars a year out of Russia. They're all over Russia, and they have joint ventures throughout Russia. So that's the story of Schlumberger in Russia, and it's a combination of a company story. I told you, like, the history of the company. Uh, it's incredibly persuasive, that story, because uh, I don't tell you what a great company Schlumberger is or that they're number one or whatever. I just tell you a narrative about what, what happened, the sequence of what happened to that company, and you draw from it all sorts of conclusions about what kind of company that is and who they are, you know. So it's very powerful, Dan, and most salespeople cannot tell their company story. They, they can't tell it as a narrative. They want to tell facts. We're number one at this. We're in Chicago, New York, and Detroit, you know, all this sort of facts of their company. And they're, they're, they're not stories. The story, the definition of a story is a sequence of related events. If it's not that, it's not a story. And you probably notice also yourself because you're, you're dedicated to storytelling. Now we hear everyone use the word story and nine times out of 10, they're not actually talking about a story. It isn't a story, right? Right. <laughs> and, and one of the things that I love about that whole thing was the idea that, you know, first of all, you as a, as a person going into Russia, you know, and you were, you've been in Norway, you're coming from Australia, you seem fearless. The, 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 um, the head of the company seemed fearless to go into to Russia. Does, does that kind of confidence or that fearlessness help tell a better story, do you think? I mean, you know, I have this feeling that everyone tells stories unconsciously. Hmm. I think that, you know, we all do it at the barbecue and, and in the pub and, you know, in hmm. our family environments. We tell them but we don't stop to think about what is it that makes a good story. <clears throat> and we don't, we don't seek out stories. I think that, I think that the, you become a, a business storyteller, or let's say you become a, a professional storyteller when you realize that it's something that you need to seek out and you need to refine and figure out how it works and how it works best. It takes a lot of experimenting, frankly, Dan, you know, your stories don't always work, but you've got to put them out there and see if they can get a life on their own. Because I think that's the definition of a good story. It's a, something that gets a life on its own and it goes traveling on its own without you. And if you're lazy, that's great. <laughs> it's doing work for you. <laughs> so, so you mentioned that sometimes stories fall flat. Have you had one, Mike? That like? You oh yeah, it happens all the time, and it and it particularly happens as you you have an idea for a story, and and the Seven Stories book is is about my book on storytelling is about looking for specific types of stories for to solve specific types of problems. And, and, while, and they fall flat as you, as you experiment. Mm -hmm. So what I've probably found is, you know, if we take a, a, you know, a typical example, people talk about case studies, but I talk about success stories. And a success story is different from a case study. Um, 
that you might have had 10 or 20 successes with your clients, but maybe only one or two of them make a good story because of this sort of, um, you, you need a certain stretching of tension, you know, things that could have gone wrong that didn't, didn't go wrong that you managed to pull out. You know, not every situation makes a really interesting story. There has to be a high degree of unpredictability in your story or you lose your audience. You know, we, we are, our attention is a precious thing we're losing our attention actually as a human race. I suspect that we're, we're destroying our attention with smartphones right now. Um, and so it's becoming even harder to hold people's attention. Um, and what holds it is the, exactly that, you know, a, a good story is unpredictable. And, and more than that, a good story has multiple possible results that, that our mind can race around and go, is this story going that way or this way or that way? You know, how is it going to go? And we can even play that multiple times. We can, you know, if you, a good movie will, will get us thinking it's going that way and then it'll get us thinking it's going this other way, you know, and then finally it resolves maybe in a completely unpredictable way again. So it's the unpredictability that holds our attention. As soon as we, as soon as we're pretty confident we can predict the result of a story, we switch off. And we switch off real fast. And is, and is that where attention spans really are, are, are the problem? It's not necessarily that everything has to be three seconds, but it's that when the story becomes disinteresting, <clears throat> uninteresting, that's when we lose our attention spans, do you think? I think so. I think it's the instant that we lose, the instant we think we know what's going on and we've got it, mm -hmm. we switch off. We might be wrong. We might not have given that the, uh, the benefit of the doubt. I'll give you, I'll give you two examples. Like the, the shortest story on record, and I, don't, I haven't been able to verify this, but the shortest story on record is supposedly Ernest Hemingway having a $10 bet that he could write a six-word story. So you ready for a six-word story? I love, I love it. Bring it on. <laughs> it is baby shoes for sale, never worn. Mm. So this is an interesting story, right? Because it's not complete. We have to run through all the unpredictable options in our mind to see if we can work, find a way to finish that story, right? Um, and another example would be the stand-up comedian. I mean, my favorite is, is Billy Connolly, uh, but you probably can imagine the guy that can stand up in a theater with a few thousand people for an hour and have them laughing and in stitches these guys are master storytellers, right? They're going for an hour ad lib almost, telling you stories. And, and I, I call both ends of that spectrum genius, mm -hmm. right? The, the genius is like completely almost breaks the mold of what a story is. And they're the opposite ends of, of, of time. You know, it's very short and very long. Um, it's interesting, mm -hmm. isn't it? You know, I it, find yeah. it really really interesting yeah. yeah well we have we have the technology like vine videos which i know vine isn't around but instagram videos maybe 15 seconds or we have the lord of the rings trilogy which is like a week long so our attention span can be held if it matters to us and that's i think something the storytellers and and sales and marketers especially forget is oh, it has to be 12 seconds no more well, no it's, just, it's not it's, it's not, not right it's not right now if you think about a 30 minute business meeting then, then we've got some constraints. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, a business meeting, we can't waste people's time, right? So a business story has to make a point or it has to make a relevant point, right? So this is why you need to prepare your business stories. But if I, t so there are three basic types of stories in seven stories. I, I, I use a fishing analogy. So you, your first job in business is to, is to create a, a human connection. And I call that the hook. You know, when you cast your, your line, your trout fishing, right? You need, to, you need to hook. And we create a human connection with our personal and company stories. So if I tell you a personal story about how I got in sales and I, I, I was asked to go to Norway and my wife happened to be eight months pregnant at the time, which she was, I'm telling you something personal about me for a purpose. And the purpose is that I can finish that story and say, well, Dan, what about you? How did you get into podcasting on storytelling, right? You know, that sounds pretty cool. And then you tell me, probably you haven't practiced it, but you tell me in three or four minutes why you do what you do. And when we tell about why we do what we do, we create a 
an atmosphere an atmosphere of of liking and authority right we we're 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 showing that we know what we're doing and and we've done this a bit mm-hmm. and we're learning about the other person and i call it kind of like the start of friendship even dan like if you think about your best friends you you know their story they know your story you trust them and you like them right so that's a connection story and the company story also is an example of a connection story you're getting a liking and a feeling for the authority of my company when I tell it as a narrative. And then we have to get in and fight. We have to differentiate ourselves. And the two stories that do that are insight stories and success stories. And, and not just any old insight story or success story. It has to be highly relevant. And then we need to get a difficult decision made. If you need to get someone to sign a contract on a complex deal, we've got to get through multiple problems of risk and inertia and difficult stakeholder meetings. And and we need a different kind of story. We need stories around value stories. What's your company like to deal with when things go wrong? And we also usually need to teach our, our client stakeholder team how to make that decision. So we need to, we need specific, I call them sales manager teaching stories to teach them how to get your kind of deal done. So these, these are really purposeful. If you think about it, you know, they need, they need crafting. They need, they need some work. And and you seem Mike like a natural storyteller. You laughed earlier about being an electrical engineer, not a storyteller, but you seem very natural. You have a, a wide array of knowledge here. Did you teach yourself that? If there's storytellers out there right now that are thinking, I may not be the greatest. I mean, how did you go from an electrical engineer to this master storyteller and teaching others? You just, I mean, how do you get there? Well, you know, you can see behind me. I like to read books, so mm-hmm. you know, I I think that. Um, uh, I've learned from a thousand sources, but if I was to name a few, um, the, the forward for seven stories is written by Mike Bosworth. Now, Mike is one of the pioneers of B2B sales uh, literature. He wrote a book called Solution Selling. That's a book about questioning and listening skills. And almost 90% of sales training is about how to ask questions. It's not about storytelling. The problem, of course, is you don't get a very open answer to your question if you haven't made a good connection first and if you don't know how to get, you know, like, so it misses storytelling. Now, Dan Mike realized that fairly late in his career, and he wrote a book in 2012 called um, What Great Salespeople Do, and that's about storytelling. And so he and I connected pretty well because, you know, a book on storytelling and he read seven stories and, and, and very kindly agreed to write the foreword. But there are lots of other areas of psychology and uh, literature, just novels uh, and er- that I've read that really made me think a lot about storytelling. Um, yeah. Too many so to name. Li- lifelong learner then, right? Yes, Never I think stop. so. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's right. That's right. Curiosity takes you a long way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and I like what, you know, when you and Douglas were talking on his show, it was, you know, talking about that connection. We tell stories, you tell a personal story to kind of break down that barrier, be vulnerable, maybe be authentic and then Correct. ask questions. If you just go in asking questions, they're like, why do you want to know? Well, who so is I, this I like guy? That. Who is this guy that I should open up and answer openly that question? Right. Yeah. Um, it's yeah. not that they're, it's not that the person that you're talking with is, is being closed or cold. It's just they don't trust you to give you an honest answer. And there's always more to a client situation than you think. Mm-hmm. Always. Much, yeah. much more. Stories and it's, it's, only, it's, only sharing, it's only sharing those stories that, that, that gets that going, right? Yeah. yeah. Like you said, it's like having a, a beer at a pub or a, a conversation over a fire, right? Um, yes. So you mentioned psychology. I want to yes. talk a little bit about the psychology of story. Um, we, we talked even beforehand, again, you on Douglas's show, I keep referencing that. Listeners go listen to that, the marketing book podcast with, my, with uh, Douglas Burdett. But you mentioned pop psychology. Let's talk a little bit about yes. that story. Yeah. So there, there's a sort of an obligatory first two chapters of every storytelling book, which is about mm-hmm. psychology and the science behind it and all of that. And And I felt like that it kind of misses the mark in most cases because it typically goes straight to talking about emotions and specifically primal, primal emotions of fear, flight, fight, this sort of amygdala responses, or the serotonin network and, and, and this kind of uh, chemicals that occur uh, as part of our internal body sense. And I wanted to, I wanted to, I wanted a better explanation. It didn't really explain 
how that works. And, and I, because I'm an electrical engineer and before I was a salesperson, my interest was artificial, artificial neural networks. It's something that happens to be quite important these days, but that was the 1990s and they sure didn't work then. But I, but I know how they work and I've played with them since and, I, and I, I've maintained an interest in that. And that is uh, computer science trying to model just an aspect of what our brain does. But it's the biggest part of our brain. If you hold two fists together in front of you, that volume and that kind of funny shape in two halves is 80% of your brain. That is the neocortex. It's actually a folded sheet of, of skin, of membrane. It's about two and a half millimeters thick. If you were to flatten it out, it's about the size of a dinner napkin or a tea towel. Mm. And if you look at it under a microscope at a cellular level, it looks like it's all the same. It's layers of nerve cells, about, about 30 billion of them. Um, and they're all connected vertically and, and in layers going across to each other. So you've got all these nerve cells connected up. And, and there's a guy called Werner Mountcastle back in the 1970s, a, a, a neuroscience researcher who made a, an observation that I think will rank, will rank with Darwin's observation about evolution. He looked at that sheet of, of tissue, two and a half mil tissue, and he said, um, it looks like it's all doing the same thing. It, it looks like structurally, whatever it's doing, it's doing the same thing. And what we're finding that it's doing, and few people are brave enough to come out with this, because you know, in academia, you can get shut down for this. What it looks like it's doing is memory sequence prediction. Memorizing sequences that happen in your environment, externally through vision and hearing and touch and smell, but also internally things that have sequences that happen in your internal body environment, like your state of arousal, the feeling of your heartbeat, your guts, all of that internal body sense. We call that interoception. All of our eight senses. So the five that you learned in primary school, plus balance, plus proprioception, your feeling of where your body is in space and interoception. So eight sensory areas, all of them map onto that neocortex. And it's, and all it's doing is looking for patterns that repeat and trying to work out what will happen next prediction. And it doesn't even need sensory information when we're planning and thinking and look and imagining in a story, for example, imagining what will happen next we're actually recalling from memory and we're predicting what will happen next. So we're predicting in a story what we would see, what we might smell, what we might hear, but we're also predicting how we would feel and how someone else would feel. So this prediction is, prediction is the most important thing to understand about stories, not really emotion. If, I mean, I can generally, generally we incorporate emotion into, into every story but we don't have to. Our stories could be purely visual or purely auditory. But the most important thing is that we are trying to predict a sequence and we can't predict it, so we pay attention. And you know in your mind, I don't know if you've not, if you ever uh, you know, arrived home and you, you drove there and you can't remember how you got there. Mm -hmm. You know, you've, you've, you've learned how to drive home. You've done it so many times that that story is not interesting. You've internalized it subconsciously. But if I was to move your, uh, la the, the, the key lock on your front door by one centimeter, you would instantly pay attention and know something's wrong, even though you don't know, even know probably what it was, right? Because suddenly this, you're not predicting the story. So that's the thing to know about this neocortex is, we are predicting our entire environment, internal and external, 100% of the time, all the time, and we don't even know we're doing it. It's only when we can't predict that we kind of pay attention to that. And that's where the story comes in. You know, it's a, it's a by design, it's something that forces people out of their comfort for prediction and makes them pay attention. And we deliver the message. We deliver the learning because there's a new sequence. Stories are high level sequence. Stories are this, then that, then that. That's a high level sequence. A low level sequence is the pattern of, of photons on your eye that tell you that that's a line or that's a dot, right? And then we build and build and build and build in our brains onto higher level sequences. And that's what a story is. It's a high level sequence. 
and we pay attention and we learn from those sequences. That's how we learn about our environment, which is fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, very much so. So if we can kind of harness that, yeah, the connection, the empathy, like, man, that's powerful. Yeah. Look, the empathy and the connection is really us trying to, to expand that model we have of our internal and external environment. We're learning something about the other person. You know, I'm telling a story and I'm trying to predict how you will feel. And I'm trying to predict how I will feel when I say it. And if I'm doing a good job of telling the story, the emotions of what I'm saying will come across and, and you'll feel what I feel yeah. as, as I tell the story. That's so cool. yeah, it's a much bigger picture than just these ancient emotional response functions that, 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 that part of the story, yeah. but it's much, much bigger. And, and for listeners, go dive deep into the seven stories every salesperson must tell. Cause I know it gets, it gets deep, but it's also just amazingly well laid out and everything. So get that. Um, when, when you're talking about stories, another thing that I know that, that, you, that you see is a difference between anecdotes and what, what you might call epic productions, right? When, and, and, yes. I, and, and, and I think, so, so I think of it this way too, is when I tell somebody I'm a storyteller, I feel like quite often they say, they think that like that means you have to tell epic stories, you have to create this beautiful big video production or do all these things, or like you said, write a play for a presentation. But in reality, it doesn't have to be quite that complex. Am I right? That's right. That's right. And if you think about the stories that you might need for a business meeting or a, or a you know, personal meeting, um, anecdotes of a particular type in a particular situation, and that's what the book lays out for you. It says, look, these are the types of stories you need to look out for. And here's why. And here's how you can find them. And here's how you can refine them. And if you know what you're looking for, it's a hell of a lot easier to find it, right? <laughs> so that's, that's, that's really what it's about. And, and I think two minutes is a good target. You know, if you think about a 30 to 60 minute business meeting and you want to tell two or three stories, two minutes. And the rest of the time is your fundamental fact sharing, logical argument. We're talking business, right? Mm -hmm. And we're just using these stories to, to break the conversation, pull your listener back to pay attention and to get this point that you want to make. So you're just delivering the point in a little Trojan horse and they don't even notice them. Most people don't even notice you're telling a story. Yeah, that's awesome. And, and, and I, you know, it breaks it down too. If you think about two minutes, it breaks it down so you can really, that concise storytelling can be so powerful. So that's whether, right. whether you're a business person trying to figure out how to tell a story, you don't have to be, uh, you don't have to be scared, right? It's not, it's not some big, you know, and then if you're a storyteller, you can help business people tell better stories by bringing that into it. So I think it's a great marriage of the two. Anyways. Yes. Yeah. I it's love interesting. Uh, I was on a, I was on a podcast with the guys from video jungle and, and we were talking about exactly this, the big, the big production and the small anecdote. And, and I kind of made an offhand remark that the big productions are made up of small anecdotes actually. Uh, you, you build your big story from your little stories. And, and one of the guys, Mark said, wow, he said, that reminds me of the movie Jaws. And he said, this is fantastic anecdote at the beginning of the movie Jaws about the USS Indianapolis in the second world war, where the ship was sunk in the Pacific ocean and the guys were eaten by sharks. Right. And it sets yeah. up, it sets up the whole story, right? It's actually a haunting, chilling story. Right. And it gets your entire audience in a different mental frame for the whole, I mean, that's a fabulous movie for, for, for pulling on the strings of fear and various emotions, right? You, it's hard to think of a better one, right? Yeah. And, and, is, and if you think about it, those little anecdotes, they are the building, block, building blocks of the little stories. And when I wrote my book, and it only took me, I started September last year, uh, I, but I had already written 30 or 40 stories and they were the framework for putting the story together. You know, these are the stories that I want to bring in. So, so you can think of the anecdotes as the building blocks of the bigger stories. And that's, I mean, for listeners who didn't really kind of hear that, that's a great piece of advice to think of if you're writing a book or creating a bigger story, think of those anecdotes first and use it like Lego building blocks or whatever. So that's, that's great, Mike. I like that. Yeah. 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 So, um, people ask, people ask me sometimes in workshops, is it okay to just make up a story? for a business point, right? Mike, could I, could I just modify my story to make it better? My customer success story or tell a story about something that really didn't happen, but makes a true point. And this is what I say. 
in our culture, we have stories that probably aren't true, that are highly persuasive. We call them myths and fables or parables, right? They're probably not factually true, but they make very true points. But notice something very important about these stories. They are attributed to people like Jesus, gods, famous scientists, people who have huge credibility in their society, not salespeople. Salespeople are not in that category, right? You're in a category that if you make up story, you, you, you blow your credibility. Right there. You, mean, you, don't have, you don't actually have the credibility to tell a mythical story, a fable. So tell true stories. And the second thing I say is that like all tools and storytelling is a tool, um, your intent matters. You, your intention has to be for your client first and yourself second. We're trying to find a way to make business that's valuable to them that we can also profit from, but it has to be that then this. If your intention is only for yourself and you're using storytelling for that, you will find yourself excluded from the high table. You, you don't build a reputation that way. So intent's yeah. important. And for salespeople, there's only one type of story to tell and it's a true story. So the end does not justify the means of tell any story to get where you want to go. By no means, it does yeah. not. That's good. Yeah. I appreciate that, that thought. That's good. Yeah, I think it's important to add because otherwise it can sound like we've got this new manipulative technique, right? right. And we don't, we don't want that. <laughs> now, if, if somebody were to tell you the, okay, you're, you're all done telling stories. You've, you've done it for a while. You got to go move on to something else. What would that last story look like for you? Hmm. How do you mean, Dan? How would, how would you go out if you could no longer be a storyteller? Is, is that even possible, I guess? I mean, I, that, that's, I, I like asking this question because I like hearing what people's last story might be, what it might look like, how they'd go, go out in a flaming whatever. Okay. Is, so, is, it even, uh, let, is it even possible? No, it's not possible because we are continual storytellers. It's, it's the nature of that neocortex, that brain that I was telling you. Mm -hmm. But if I reframe the question with your permission, Dan, sure. what story do I think I would like as a legacy? Mm -hmm. uh, I would like to tell you a story. It's a, not that short an anecdote, but it's an interesting story. Uh, one, of the, one of the reasons I felt like I was qualified to write seven stories. And it's an interesting thing when you start to be an author is you, you have these feelings of self doubt. Like, you know, is there anything I have to say, right? Yes. <laughs> why would, why would anyone want to even read it? You know, and I, I've had an experience that few salespeople have, and, and it's more by nature of my adventurous character. So you've kind of heard that I've lived and worked all over the world. And I, have also jumped from industry to industry. So I've found myself in this sort of situation that every new salesperson finds themselves, which is, you know, nothing. You don't know about your company's products and services. You haven't got a clue about your client and you, you have to sell something. You've got this target, right? So, and this is a very confronting situation. Well, I've put myself through that five times. And, and that's unusual, right? Most people find a comfort area of business and they stick there, right? And what I've discovered is that, um, that there are stories that you need. You need to seek out these stories. You need to be able to tell your company story. What is this company I'm working for? Who the hell are they? You know, how do I tell that story? Because that's what your client also wants to hear. They don't know your company. So when I was work, I, I went from selling high technology to selling cooking and cleaning and catering services in the oil and gas and mining industry. But we're not talking small contracts. We're talking 20, 30, hundred million dollar contracts. And what I noticed in these contracts this is in Australia, mostly in remote Australia, big, big mining camps, tens, 30,000 people, big mining camps and oil and gas camps. What I noticed in our contracts was we had a requirement to, hire a certain proportion of indigenous people. So in Australia, we have about 1.5% of our population are the original Australian inhabitants. They've been here for 50,000 years. You have something similar in the United States. Many countries have that situation. So there would be like this five, 10, 15% requirement for, for hiring locals. And it was in the contract and I was bidding on these big tenders. And what I noticed almost immediately was we were non-compliant. We, we had a target of 10, we hit two. 
And I so start, you know, the engineer, you know, how's that? Why is that? And I got this sort of not very satisfactory answer, which was, it's impossible. We can't hit that target. So I started asking the clients, you know, so, you know, you've, you've put this in the tender. Why are you asking for that? And, you know, what does it really mean for you? And what I found was that they really wanted to hit those targets, but they hadn't figured out how and none of their contractors had either. They, they essentially put it out as like a hopeless problem. You know, we try and we fail. And so I had that kind of mullying around, you know, and if there's, that's the, like, and for me with sales, like an unsolved problem is something that, that keeps going in my mind. And then I noticed one of our contracts, which was up in the far northwest of Western Australia in an area called the Kimberley. And there's a mine there that, that mines, it's just about to finish production actually. It mines one of the fewest, one of the only places in the world that mines pink diamonds. And um, it's called Argyle. And they had nearly 50% indigenous pop, uh, participation in a hundred man workforce. And I'm like, wow. How do they do that? And so I'm back in headquarters in Melbourne. No one really knew. So I go, well, I'm going to go and find out. So I flew there and I met the contract manager, John Musty. And I'm like, well, how do you manage to do this? And he took me through this, you know, explaining to me what it's like. He said, Mike, these people, the first problem I have is I get their application and a huge proportion of them have a criminal record. And we have a corporate rule that says you can't hire people with a criminal record. And so does the mining customer, right? So, uh, you know, that's first strike. So I go to the head of security and I say, look, you know, I've met this person. I'll vouch for them. They'll be inside the camp. They'll be okay. So I get past that. And then the next thing is um, they've never worked before. They've never held down a job. So I split all of the jobs down into the tiniest little task. Maybe it's making a bed. You're going to learn how to make a bed for the next few days. And then I add the tasks and then I get them out multiple tasks. And then finally, they, after a few months, they can do every job in the camp. And then the next problem, they'll come to me and say, there's been a death in the family. And it's, they come from very big tribal groups and they have very high levels of, of accident and injury and they're expected to go to funeral. And for one thing, they have money and they're expected to fund the funeral actually. Hmm. She's like, well, do you have to go? And he says, sometimes you can see in their eyes that they don't really want to go. And so then he said, well, okay, they help, he helps them. So they don't need to go. But if they have to go here, the next question is, well, how long do you have to go for? And they'll say two days. He said, okay, there'll be a car there waiting to bring you back to the camp after two days. And what he was laying out for me, Dan, was someone who wanted to solve the problem. And this is like the enlightenment for me was, ah, uh, the other camps, they don't actually want to solve this problem. They want to use all of the excuses there are, and there are many to not hire these people. But what I saw was that when you get, a, when you get to 50-50 and you look, about, look at how the Indigenous people interact with the non-Indigenous people, they sit together at lunch, they're friendly, they're sharing jokes. They're, they're not just like the one token or two token Indigenous people. They're just part, a normal part of the workforce. And that was inspiring. And, and, and I used that story, Dan, to win contracts and to change the way people think about how we hire Indigenous people. And, and I love that story. It's an inspirational story. Yeah, for sure. I was, and, and intriguing. I was in the whole time and picturing it. And that's incredible. Yeah. You're a hell of a storyteller, Mike. Yeah. So if you think about a story that might do work when you're gone, yeah, that, that would be an example of a story that could do some work for you once you go, right? Absolutely. Awesome, man. Well, I, I could spend hours talking to you, but, uh, but, but the, the, the time runs short very quickly. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Where's the best place for people to find you and to, uh, to get to seven stories every salesperson must tell? Well, just search for that. <laughs> Seven <laughs> stories every salesperson must tell. If I'm sure your listeners know how to drive a Google uh, interface. Um, so that will get them to, to the books available on Amazon and a bunch of other bookstores. Uh, I have a website where I post a whole bunch of interesting, interesting stories. It's called my7stories.com. Yep. There's also online training there, including free training where I I break down the methods that I use to teach salespeople storytelling. We do a lot of video messaging just for your information, Dan. So what, I, what I've discovered is this is like, you know, we're trying to teach conversation skill and it's difficult to teach conversation skill because 
people have habits of conversation and mm-hmm. salespeople have a lot of bad habits as a rule. <laughs> it's a funny thing about selling. Well, you know, it's probably true of all businesses, but you know, selling is a bit weird in that uh, buyers need to buy and you can be lucky and sell something and it wasn't you, but we have this human tendency to assume that we did the right thing when, when they bought, right? And we can right. easily build up bad conversation habits really easily. So, so changing habits is not easy and, and getting the habit of storytelling requires re- repetition. So, you know, the sequence memory prediction organ, the neocortex, it needs repeated sequences to learn, right? So we don't just learn from one thing happening. We haven't detected the sequence when it just happens once. We need to instantiate it with repetition. And we do, we do video messaging for that. And I'll just explain briefly for your listeners how it works. So we, we research a story and then we just try and tell it. And the first time we tell it, so I'll say to myself, go, well, you know, tell me, send that story to me over video message. Just use WhatsApp. So the nice thing about using WhatsApp is you've got your phone there and when you record the video, well, the first thing, it's, it's there for you to replay and listen to. So you might do that and think, I'm not going to send that to Mike because that's not very good. So you do it again. So there's the first repetition, right? So you do it again and again. The second thing is it tells you how long the story is. It says, okay, it's five minutes. Mike told me it's got to be two minutes. That's too long. So then you start trying to work out what's essential and what's not essential. How do I tighten that story? Um, and that, so that story about the, the mining camp, for example, there are quite a few elements to that story. And that's the longest story in my book. And I struggled to see if I could get it shorter. But I didn't want to leave out the different ways that it's difficult to employ Indigenous people. I wanted to keep in those things. So, th- so that's an example of where you maybe think, well, I, if, I, if I shorten it, I'll lose something. Mm-hmm. But that process of going backwards and forwards and refining is really important because you're internalizing the story. Now you're able to tell it when you need to at the right time. When should I tell that story? I'll tell it at this time and now it's tight and I can tell it and it'll, you'll do a good job. So that's, that's important. So it's, yeah. So there's online training where you can hear me telling the different sorts, sorts of stories, but also I give you some, um, some structure, you know, fill out these events. It's got to be a sequence of events. Look for this event, look for that type of event. And then have a go. And then all I do with it for coaching is, is backwards and forwards on video message. And I can do that for anyone anywhere in the world. So it's kind of cool way to, to connect and, and offer a bit of coaching on stories. Absolutely. Awesome. We'll put the links in the show notes and yeah. send some people Thanks. your way. Excellent. Good, you? hey, so man. Dan, I, I, I want to know uh, what made you a storyteller. I want to ask you, how, how did you become a storyteller? Was there a point or a, a realization, a turning point? You know, I think it was back in either fourth or fifth grade in, in my elementary school days when I began to discover writing as a, mm. as a way for me to express myself, um, poetry a little bit as, as, a, young, as a young guy, uh, a little bit of short stories. And I just realized that I had the power to hold people's attention and to, and, and it was, then I didn't realize it, but later I realized not only hold their attention, but make a difference. And so through sharing stories, I could educate people. I could share emotionally with them. I could help them make a decision. I just found the power of story back then. And, and I, over the years I've developed that uh, appreciation for it and the deeper meaning behind it. But I think it just back in fourth or fifth grade, I had a teacher uh, back then that encouraged me to write poetry and to write. And I just love the idea of writing. So, and over the years, that's, I wanted to do that in some way. So whether it was in news production, whether it was in marketing, whether, you know, whatever it was, telling those stories has always been part of who I am. It's in my DNA. <laughs> yeah. It's real. I find that interesting. And I also find it interesting that you use the word power and we reserve special place in our society for the storytellers. And it, it doesn't seem to have much survival benefit at first look, you know, I mean, why would we, why would we waste scarce resources from our tribe on someone who can just amuse us and tell us stories? And of course the answer is it's a lot deeper than that. It's actually how we learn and how we're inspired and motivated to do something. And, uh, and I, lo- I love the fact that it's so it's not transparent. It's opaque actually how this works, but yeah. that's great. That's yeah. awesome. Well, thanks for asking, man. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks. Great. Yeah. And, and then that's a, that's a big message of the book is share your stories. Yeah. Ask, ask for the other person's story. That's great. Absolutely. 
Great. Well, thanks for your time. We'll send people your way. This has been a lot of fun, Mike. Thanks, Dan. Good on you. So thank you once again to my guest, Mike Adams, author of Seven Stories Every Salesperson Must Tell. Uh, what a fantastic guy he is. What a fantastic interview that was. A great conversation. Man, I'm just, I'm, I'm spellbound. That was a lot of fun. I hope you enjoyed it as well. Be sure to visit Mike online. Those links are in the show notes. And if you enjoyed the episode, please consider sharing it all over. Uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, Pinterest, Facebook, Snapchat, email it, text it. Go up and tell somebody on the street, hey, stranger, check this out. Uh, wherever you can share with other storytellers, always very helpful and very much appreciated. Until next time, here's to telling our stories and having those stories to tell. Cheers. Thank you.